First of all, good evening, everybody. Second, thank you for taking the time and trouble to be here. Thank you to our guest speakers and panelists who have taken the time to be with us. And a special thank to our American guest who traveled a long way to be here, Randy Zuckerberg. We're talking today about one of the most pressing problems of our country, our region, our time. Future generations will judge us on the degree to which we solved it. Unfortunately, problems of this magnitude don't get solved without a lot of people taking the time and trouble to solve them. People like you, people like us, businesses like yours, businesses like mine. You know, evolutionary biologists spend a lot of time thinking about whether man as a species is truly capable of altruism. People such as the late George R. Price, a hero of a new play, calculating kindness. On the whole, they tend to think that we're not. George Price tried to illustrate our selfishness mathematically. We're good at calculating. We're good at cost-benefit analysis. We're good at risk-return ratios. We're good at self-interest, but we're not so good, it seems, at genuine altruism, a true selflessness. What we really like, of course, are those win-win situations, those occasions when we can have our cake and eat it too, when we can do the right thing morally in the knowledge that one way or another, we'll get paid for it. Oh yes, we're very good at those. Take, for example, the case of the chronically homeless in American cities. Lone homeless men or women with disabling condition who have either been continuously homeless for a year or more, or had at least four episodes of homelessness in the past three years. Once upon a time, nobody seemed to know what to do about the chronically homeless. But then America had a light bulb moment began to realize that chronically homeless cost the public purse a lot of money. Hospital and other medical care, psychiatric and addiction programs, court cases and prison, all these things are very expensive, very expensive, 30 to $50,000 per year per person. So wouldn't it be cheaper, said someone, to give them permanent housing, give them their own free affordable private accommodation. Cheaper because it might help them get better, help them become happier, more productive, less troublesome citizens, and keep them out of harm's way, and help make the streets safer. And so, what is known as permanent supportive housing was born. It's proving very successful, and because it's successful, it's seen to work. It's catching on all over the place. It's expensive, yes, but not as expensive as the alternative. And it has major social and human benefits. Chronic homelessness in America is one thing, and occupational inequality in Kuwait and the Middle East, female joblessness or gender discrimination at work or in the labor market, another very different thing. For start, it's a much bigger issue, affecting a far larger proportion of the population, and therefore with far greater social, cultural, economic, psychological consequences. Nonetheless, there are significant parallels. Permanent supportive housing is a classic case of win-win, of doing the right thing morally, the human thing, and the thing we want to do, and the knowledge that you're getting paid for it getting paid financially, and getting paid socially. It's even the case of win, 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 because you're inspiring others, because success breeds imitation, because you're leading by example. But narrowing the gender gap in Kuwait and the Middle East workplace is also a classic case of win, win, or win, 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 or would be, or will be. It's the right thing to do, but it's not just an act of charity. 
For businesses, it's the right thing to do, but also the self-interested thing to do. I am no George Price, but I believe I can prove it, more or less mathematically. Let me briefly explain. First of all, in the case of anyone, is it any doubt to agree to which the, our region is different from other regions? Let me give you some statistics. To be frank, I'm gonna give you some more statistics than I would normally in this kind of speech, but they matter. They matter because they reveal the stark truth. They matter because they tell a powerful story. They matter because it's a truth and a story about real lives. I want to begin by making sure that we're clear on the meaning of two key terms, the labor participation rate and gender participation gap. The labor participation rate is a percentage of the population aged 15 or over that is economically active. The gender participation gap is a difference between male and female labor participation rates. It's by no means the only measure of gender inequality in the labor market, but it's a very important one. In North America, in 2014, the male and female participation rates were 69% and 57%, respectively. The gender participation gap was therefore 12%. In the world as a whole, in the same year, 2014, the male and female labor participation rates were 77% and 50%. The gender participation gap was therefore more than double that in North America. It was 27%. But what if our region, the Middle East and North Africa? Well, in 2014, the male and female labor participation rates were 75% and 22%. The gender participation gap was therefore 53%. 22%, the lowest female participation rate by some way of any region in, in the world. 53%, the largest gender participation gap in the world. Double the global average. Four to five times North American figure. Yes, yes, I can hear yourself saying, but what about Kuwait? Kuwait's different. We must be doing much better than that. Actually, we are. In 2014, the female labor participation rate was 44%. That's well below the North American or the world, and unchanged since the year 2000, but precisely double the rate in the MENA region. However, our male participation rate is also high at 83%. So the gender participation gap is a mighty 39%. 12% in North America, 27% in the world, 39% in Kuwait. 39%, not lower than since 2000, but it's actually gotten worse. And female participation rate that hasn't changed in 14 years. 14 years. Of course, none of this might matter if women in our country and our region didn't want to work. But the fact is, they do or would if they were properly educated. We'll show you a video and there will be a lecture explaining the results of recent survey of working Kuwaiti women. I don't want to jump the gun, but it's clear to me, surprise, surprise, that women in work, paid work that is, want to work for broadly the same reasons that men want to work. And in broadly the same way. Above all, the degree of commitment leaves me in no doubt that we're in a very large number of women not in work who would like to be, or would have liked to be. Moreover, gender gaps are expensive. Expensive for individual businesses and expensive for economy. Let's start with individual businesses. Study after study shows that companies with reasonable numbers of women in senior management positions, the more gender diversified companies, outperform companies that don't. And this appears especially true of companies with a focus on innovation. Why might this be? Well, first, the answer is simple. If you don't employ women or employ them but don't use them as you use their male colleagues, you're not properly exploiting 50% of the human talent pool. Talent pool and knowledge pool. 
The other answer is more complex. For whatever reason, it, it might be biology, it might be social conditioning, we don't really know. Women appear to be better at certain things than men. In particular, they appear on average to have a higher social or emotional intelligence. A recent MIT study looked at the question of whether there was a strong positive correlation between collective intelligence, the intelligence of a group working as a group on a range of tasks, and the average or maximum intelligence of group members. There wasn't. What there was, though, was a strong positive correlation between a group's performance and its members' willingness to listen, its members' skill at conversational turn-taking, and, most important of all, its members' average social sensitivity or their ability to read and understand and respond to other people's emotions. All of which meant that performance was also strongly correlated with something else. The presence of women in the group. For a group, read team. For a team, read company. Now for the economy. A recent McKinsey uh, Global Institute concluded that gender gaps in participation hours, work and productivity were all bridged. Worldwide, the world economy would be $28.4 trillion, or 26% richer. If it's 26% for the world, imagine what it would be for the Middle East. Yes, let's imagine, with a little help of Christina Lagarde of the IMF, in 2013, Mrs. Lagarde gave a speech here in Kuwait, which she said the following. For the entire Middle East and North Africa region, the gap between male and female participation in the labor force over the past decade was almost triple the average gap of the emerging market and developing economies. If this gap had simply been double instead of triple, the gains for the entire region, the Gulf countries included, would have been enormous almost a trillion dollars in output, amounting to gains of 6% in GDP annually. Additional growth of 6% per annum for the entire decade. That's growth of more than 26%. That's a growth of something like 80%, growth that didn't happen. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a problem, a human problem, and a social problem. A human problem with a normal social cost. But it's also a business problem and an economic problem. A business problem with an enormous economic cost. We need to solve it because it's the right thing to do. We need to solve it because it's very strongly in our interest to do so. In the interest of our businesses, in the interest of our economy, in the interest of our society, in the interest of our wives, our sisters, our daughters, we need to solve it because it would be self-defeating not to do so. We need to solve it because we are human beings and because human beings like nothing more than having their cake and eating it. Thank you for your attention.